Hello, I'm excited today to introduce to you a framework, um, an evolutionary health perspective. And this framework will help you to gain personal resiliency no matter what comes your way. Um, first, I wanted to basically let you know that I'm gonna be using evolutionary, the words evolutionary and ancestral um, interchangeably. I've been studying this approach for about a decade now, um, and I will often slip between the two, evolutionary and ancestral. Uh, in general, evolutionary refers to the change in shape and health of any organism on Earth ever in response to its environment. Ancestral is a little bit more specific to our ancestors, our human species in general. First, I, I really do want to honor the land that I'm speaking to you from today. This is my, what I call my front yard today. Um, it's the same land that the UW occupies at the moment. It's the ancestral land of the Ho-Chunk Nation. And uh, I understand they were forced to cede this land in 1832. I've been learning a little bit more about uh, the indigenous populations and where we sit today. And I encourage you to go to the website native-land.ca to learn more about um, indigenous territories, languages spoken, and uh, subsequent treaties across the US. So this is probably familiar to most, most people now. This is, the, uh, this is the novel coronavirus, 2019 coronavirus. Um, I do want to mention that my intent initially with this talk was more from a resiliency to this particular disease. Um, but 2020 has thrown us many more moments of truth, and I want to recognize that as well. Um, we've had some serious fires and droughts and floods as related to climate change. Of course, this uh, pandemic, uh, COVID-19, and then most recently, global protests uh, for highlighting systemic, racial, uh, ra systemic racism and uh, racial injustice. Hopefully that's easier for me to say these days. Uh, my intention was to focus initially on this guy um, as it, result, as it uh, applies to your health, um, but this evolutionary health framework is very holistic and it's going to connect you with this world, its ecosystems and communities to facilitate resiliency in your life no matter what moment of truth you happen to be facing. So what are we doing about this right now? The coronavirus, um, the public health experts are telling us uh, to wash our hands, to stay away from each other, physically distant, and to wear masks. And this is all great advice and it all seems to be helping uh, to keep down the rate of infection in this, uh, particularly in Wisconsin. I feel like we're doing pretty good if you look at the maps. But there is one really, something very glaringly missing in my mind from, um, from the advice that we're told, and that is how to be proactive in your health and, and consequently resilient to this disease. Um, we have a lot of personal responsibility. And, and now that we're learning a lot more about this, um, this virus, we know that the odds of succumbing to this virus increase with age. We also know that it increases with comorbidities, um, which means the healthier you are to start, the better chance you have in naturally uh, your body's immune system naturally defending you from this guy and so that's kind of where I'm starting from um, how can we be naturally proactive in our health and wellness with respect to the coronavirus this is um, this is essentially exercising your immune system like you would do any muscle so I'm about to ask you to do something that you may feel like is impossible. Um, for the next little while, I want you to kind of 
attempt to kind of forget everything you were taught about how to take care of your health in this world today. You need to approach your personal resiliency with a very open mind. Um, we were born into this place with a pre-existing set of rules. Um, and I firmly believe that a lot of what we're taught about our health and wellness, um, I don't believe it's miss, I think the, it's good intentions, but I, I feel like it misses a really big piece of our uh, puzzle. And you'll find that that's um, an evolutionary piece of our puzzle. We're not considered species that are part of nature anymore. And um, that is very, um, that's a, <laughs> you'll find that this is a really large piece of your personal health and your personal resiliency. I want to give you a little bit about my background, my story in this. I have my PhD in uh, geology, actually. What you're looking at is uh, an Eocene lake system, or the deposits of an Eocene lake system. This, this lake was about as large as the, the Great Lakes today, and it existed for about four million years. And it fluctuated from freshwater to hypersaline and back to freshwater over its life. And we can interpret those paleo environments using the sediments, using the fossils we find, the leaves and the, and the critters. And we can say something about how the environment changed based on the flora and fauna present. This is, um, these are evolutionary forces that acted on these ecosystems. And I mention this because it informs my own health story. Um, my story begins well, begins <laughs> at birth, like everybody's story does. But my my health journey, my journey in this, begins after I overcame some fertility issues related to um, my second child. Uh, fertility issues turns out are a kind of a canary in the coal mine with respect to your health, which I didn't recognize at the time. I embarked on a an eat less, move more mission to lose the final 10 pounds of baby weight. Um, and I was really successful in this. I found I had little control over the size and shape of my body. Um, but at the time, I was thinking that um, a smaller size equated to better health. And uh, I would later find that's not the case, necessarily. Um, I began to have to lose my hair. I had an extra heartbeat. I was catching any and every cold. Uh, that was in the area. <laughs> I developed skin conditions. I went to the doctor multiple times to see what the problem might have been, and she couldn't diagnose me with anything. All of my labs came back normal. She did send me to a psychiatrist. Um, the psychiatrist offered me anxiety meds. Um, he didn't think that I had anything wrong with me. I wasn't a hypochondriac or anything. He just thought maybe I needed to chill out. I eventually did get to a cardiologist who was able to confirm that I had something wrong with my heart, so I was prescribed a beta blocker. And that beta blocker, in conjunction with some of the other medications I was on, uh, decreased my blood pressure quite a bit. So every time I stood up, I'd feel faint, or any time I'd go to the gym, um, I just couldn't get my heart rate up. And I was really concerned with the side effects of these medications that I was on. And I thought to myself, um, this isn't right. I'm not, getting, I'm not getting to the root cause of why my body's doing what it is. I'm treating symptoms. And um, because I went through school and I got my PhD in science, I was, you know, I was kind of empowered at that point to do a self-study. Um, and this is when I discovered ancestral health or evolutionary health. And it was kind of a huge epiphany to me. <laughs> I've been studying it all my life so far, and I never applied it to me, um, somebody who is nature. Um, and it made huge amounts of sense to me. So within four months of kind of enacting these principles, I was weaning myself off of every single medication I was on and um, feeling like I was really thriving again. To set the stage, I want to give everyone a little bit of perspective. This is, of course, our Earth. And I'm about to show you um, 
4.6 billion years of evolutionary history of this earth if you were to plot it on a and in one hour so you can see that if you begin at the first second of that hour where the earth's crust forms and you move along this this kind of clock over time you can see bacteria evolving around close to 15 minutes of that hour um, you can see oxygen free oxygen in the atmosphere almost takes a half an hour for free oxygen in our atmosphere to happen first multicellular organisms are around 40 minutes after the hour and the rest of our uh, massive sort of evolutionary history is, is within the last 10 minutes of that hour. And when do humans show up? In the last tenth of a hundred, like at the very last minute of this hour. Um, nature, all of the evolutionary processes on Earth have been humming along uh, perfectly fine without us <laughs> for most of uh, life's on Earth, most of evolutionary history. So nature innovates with shape and information. This is the power of the natural world. And it's kind of an awesome, awesome thing that, you know, even without us, things are going to happen on this Earth. So you are nature, and this is something that I think is a very important concept to grasp with respect to evolutionary health and ancestral health. Um, here's some ideas around how we've looked at other species on Earth, and we can see that they have uh, what we call diseases of captivity. Um, and it is easier to look at diseases of captivity in other species, because we do have them captive in zoos and aquariums and such. Um, there's a really great example of orcas at SeaWorld, where um, they tend to swim in these shallow pools and circles, and then they get this kind of fin that flops over to the left. It's this kind of floppy fin syndrome. And one of the hypotheses around this is that in nature, the orcas dive hundreds of meters into the ocean as part of their hunting strategy. Um, and in captivity, they're unable to get to that water depth and pressure. And the, that environment that they're no longer able to experience has really influenced the sort of stability of their fin structure. So their floppy fin is a result of um, their captivity. There's this field of science called biomimicry, which is in uh, biomimicry.org is a great website to visit. And it is about solving problems the way nature did it first, because nature is uh, such a great innovator and there's a couple of really great examples of this as well um, the bullet train in Japan the fastest train on earth um, Had a real problem every time it would go through a tunnel. It would create this sonic boom when it came out um, so the engineers turned to the Kingfisher <laughs> Kingfisher technology uh, the Kingfisher can dive into water without making a splash and so they took the same ratios of the beak of that kingfisher and they applied it to the front of the bullet train. And they increased the efficiency of that train and they, they eliminated the sonic boom when it came out of the tunnel. So kingfisher technology for the win here. And there's another great um, example of termite mound technology actually. Termites grow these massive, well they, don't, they build these massive mounds and the tunnel systems within those mounds are essentially cooling and air conditioning their homes. Um, engineers have taken that technology to build buildings that sit on the equator. And they, um, using termite mound technology, they're able to naturally maintain something like 70 degrees of temperature in these buildings without any you know, climate control system at all. So um, biomimicry.org is a fabulous, fabulous um, website to visit. And they have a, a sort of a sister site called Ask Nature. And you can ask nature a certain question, and it'll, it'll deliver you an answer. Importantly, this whole concept that you are nature, and nature innovates with shape and information, is holistic. 
Nothing in nature acts in isolation. And this indicates to me that if we isolate any one thing, there could be unintended consequences as a result of this. Um, and I've experienced this, actually. Um, I used to do roller derby. So I was, <laughs> I was in a squat for two hours every practice, and my, uh, my quads, my muscles got really large. But um, the muscles next to them were underworked. Uh, and so I would routinely get injured when I had a stronger muscle next to a weaker one. Um, so that that's kind of an example that we can we could think about today of, of um, working something in isolation. You might consider examples of um, isolated nutrients to various supplements and whatnot. Um, if you supplement with something, uh, you may be missing a range of cofactors, um, and you know you're experimenting with your body in that way. So how does this process of evolution work um, with organisms. We, are, we have the superpower of adaptation. And adaptation and healing, our immune systems basically are designed to heal us, right? And so we can see this if we lift weight, we'll gain muscle. We can adapt if we catch a cold, we'll heal from that cold, assuming our immune system is working properly. If you change your diet, you can gain or lose weight. So we have real um, tangible examples of how we adapt to our environment. But the, the health and shape that you are and you have are a result of how you've adapted to the information in your environment. So the environment that you experience most shapes your health, literally. Um, here's a great example. If you experience the chair environment the most, the shape and health of your body Will be, will be influenced by a piece of furniture. You can literally decrease the length of your calves and your hamstrings if you sit down more than you stand up, which can cause further in injury when you try and go and train for your, your uh, 10K. So here's the whole crux of it. This is the framework. Evolutionary health explores and acts on this disconnect. It's just connect between our health and our modern environment. This slide here shows the ancestral Pueblo um, cliff dwellings from Mesa Verde. And when I saw this, I was just kind of amazed. I was like, wow, this isn't very long ago. This is um, very, can you imagine having built this? Um, this was all built by hand. This is a lot of work. They got really good movement. They were outside. Um, this, is, this is a spectacular spot. One of the things I want to, let, to, to, to note is that evolutionary health is not, it's not a reenactment of the past. We're not going back in time and you know, going out in the woods and living off grid, although I would probably really enjoy that. <laughs> um, it's not about reenacting the past. It's about considering what we're missing, what sort of movement, food, sleep, uh, what kind of nutrients we're missing in our life, what kind of information we're missing in the life, um, because really um, evolutionary health, given that organisms, an organism's environment forms its shape, we assume that the human species evolved to be optimally fit under these natural conditions as well. So that is the major assumption here behind evolutionary health. So we can use this framework to help us make decisions to sift through uh, consumer messages, uh, attention-grabbing headlines, voices in our head that begin to question how, how our choices um, influence our overall well-being. Uh, we know right now the, the marketing force is strong, and we are um, most marketing messages that come to you are the, the intention is for them to make money, maybe not super supportive of your individual health. So from this evolutionary health perspective, um, natural inputs inform the strength of our immune system and our resiliency to disease, both chronic and acute. So I consider five main pillars of evolutionary health, food, sleep, environment, movement, and sort of community and relationships. Um, so we'll kind of flip through these, these pillars and we'll kind of compare and contrast. 
um, look at the modern situation for each of these, and then kind of brainstorm what it might have used to have been like. And from this perspective, for this compare and com contrast, you can individually um, apply this to your life and begin to make choices that are maybe closer to nature. This, importantly, is not a magic pill. This is a way to change your sort of perspective and worldview in life, moving forward, and then making incremental change over time. You will experience the health benefit of this, and it may not be tomorrow upon waking up. It, it, it will be on the scale of how are you feeling next year as a result. Um, this is another, another thing we have to kind of get through our heads on this. It's, this is a, a life way and not a magic pill for sure. So disconnect number one, our food. So this is a picture that uh, most of us in Western civilization are quite familiar with. This is how we get our food today. Um, what I see is a bunch, well, in this picture, I see a bunch of things that personally to me look all like colorful and um, it's, it's for marketing purposes. They want you to grab this one. I like this color. I want this flavor. Um, here's a chocolate cake. <laughs> uh, here's some canned fruit. Um, this is all very processed and packaged uh, food. The, the other thing I see here is the variety of food. We've never had the, the kind of choice as to what to eat as we have today. I mean, the sky's the limit. We have, we can transport food all over this world, and so whatever you want, you can have. I also observe that the movement required, the work required to get any one of these foods is very minimal. It's very efficient. And I also uh, recognize that we are wired for efficiency, so this helps us in great ways. Um, we don't have to work for this, uh, physically work for this. Um, the economic work for this is a totally different story. I also see, despite, I see, despite all the choice, I see a very low variety of nutrients in this picture. I see a lot of sugar. <laughs> and I see a lot of um, basically in our country because of industrial food systems and because of um, farm subsidies, we are able to get very relatively cheaply things made of corn, wheat, and soy. And therefore, a lot of our diets are very high in these three foods and uh, end up being low in diversity overall. Those are the kinds of things that I see. Um, from where I am in my personal journey, I also question whether or not these things are actually food. My definition of food has changed over time. So what I would like to do is, um, with, with that as our modern view, um, I would like to open it up to you to see if you can think about what our ancestral ways might have been. If you can kind of compare and contrast this to food from an evolutionary perspective. And in this picture, um, you see some eggs from my backyard upon a time <laughs> when I raised some birds. Um, which was a very fun experience. But what I would suggest at this point is for you to take a moment and think about how you define food. Think about how what you uh, collect as food today would have been different from what your ancestors and their ancestors collected as food. And I can give you a minute to kind of think about that. Um, before I 
offer you my suggestion. Okay, my, my ideas on food today are the seasonality of food. Our ancestors very much likely uh, ate from their land, and whatever was presented to them in that season is what they ate. It may be a whole lot of um, dandelion, for example, which a lot of people actively try and uh, evict from their yards today. Dandelion is a very useful food. It made a whole lot of um, rabbit. Uh, if you look around Madison, there's a ton of rabbits around here. These are the kinds of foods that they could get locally. Um, we can expand that today. We have, a, we have a great local farm system, and we have some really great local co-ops that uh, really do try to source their food from uh, a relatively small um, carbon footprint area. And if you ate, if you were to eat seasonally, you would get a giant diet that changed over the course of a year. And ultimately, that the, the bulk of your diet over the course of that year would be very diverse, even if it was you ate the same thing every day for a week. Um, foods would have been har harvested relatively freshly. Uh, definitely, the whole um, industrial food system with all these preservatives in it. Uh, that's for shelf stability and that kind of thing, which has great intention, uh, may have some unintended consequence. Uh, for example, a lot of preservatives, uh, they, they, their, their intent is to reduce the growth of bacteria and microbes. Well, your gut has plenty of bacteria and microbes in it, in it that are actually very useful to you. And so what is the net effect of those preservatives on your own internal ecosystem? These are questions, I think valid questions. And in the past, our ancestors had to move to eat and they had to work in some way to make those foods to eat. And so there is an, there's an aspect of moving, there's an aspect of being outside, and there's an aspect of, of harvesting um, fresh foods from local healthy soils, and this all plays into um, what would what I would consider um, an optimal human diet for personal resiliency. So the next pillar is our sleep, and today I would argue. Sleep is generally unprioritized. I do I do see a lot of people kind of waking up to the to the idea that sleep is very very good for you. In fact, lots of researchers would say sleep is the number one thing uh, that can affect your health. Um, I think that's pretty individual personally, but I do believe that because of our modern environment, we've effectively extended our daylight hours. We can work deeper into the night. Um, we are very insulated from the earth in our sleep. We sleep indoors, um, which is uh, you know part of our environment that we'll, we'll talk about next. Um, we tend to stare at blue lights at night because our screens now are emitting largely blue light versus um, the, the wide range of spectrums uh, of the visible light from the sun and outdoors. So. There's a lot of research on how blue light affects our, our hormonal choreography and how the lack of sleep affects our hormonal choreography. Um, we have this thing called a circadian rhythm. And, and it's not just us, it's like every cell in our body and all the microbes in our body and every organism on Earth responds to the daylight cycles. Um, and when we don't show up for sleep, um, our, and our bodies are on this sort of circadian autopilot, we are missing out on a lot of kind of our hormonal and um, choreography and our, and our cleanup systems, you know, where we are, we're not able to heal and grow and sort of um, 
remove toxins from our body when we're not asleep for a specific time during the evening. So our sleep environment is, uh, and our sleep habits are very important. Um, and from an ancestral perspective, I'd like for you to think about for a moment how you would think uh, your ancestors um, viewed sleep and what their habits might have been that are different from ours today. So uh, from, from my perspective, from this evolutionary health perspective, um, our ancestors would have been likely sleeping outside or more intensely. Excuse me? Um, our, <laughs> would have been sleeping outside or more intimately connected to the earth in some way. They would have been experiencing seasonal temperature changes and even sort of diurnal temperature changes. At night, it tends to get... Uh, a little bit cooler outside. Uh, when you sleep today in our modern environment, it's like we're kind of in uh, springtime or summertime all year long, all day and night long. We have this tight climate control, so our bodies are not experiencing uh, fluctuating temperatures. And then we may be wrecking our internal thermostats as a result. Um, at night time, our ancestors, if they needed to see, they may have used flame, which is a, a different sort of uh, light than the blue light from your screen. Um, they would have not had an alarm clock. Of course, they probably wouldn't have had to, you know, get up to go to work in the morning necessarily. Uh, but the natural alarm clock um, is very interesting. I have an alarm on my phone that just wakes me up with bird calls and I've been sleeping with my windows open more lately and been getting up earlier because I am actually hearing those bird calls um, out the window so the natural alarm is kind of a is a is a great place to aim for um, in our sleep patterns so another evolutionary disconnect is our environment, and this may look very familiar to you from our sort of office environment, although today we're, we are sort of more in our home environment um, because of this pandemic. Still, it's, it shows a lot of, um, if, if you think about our bodies as changing and being informed by the environment in which we spend the most time, Think about how your the environment your body's experiencing when you go to work. Um, in this picture, you can see a whole lot of bright fluorescent lights. You can see a whole lot of chairs, a lot of sitting down. Um, I can almost smell the furniture in this in this environment here. So there's a whole lot of um, off gassing, maybe paints or furniture or fabrics that will be breathing in in this environment. And again, this is, um, this is climate controlled. So you will experience the comfort um, that you need to, to be able to facilitate sit, sitting down for a long period of time and getting your work done. Um, again, nothing wrong with the intentions of doing this, but thinking about what our bodies fundamentally need to thrive, um, we can come up with some better strategies for uh, navigating these environments for our health. And so again, from an ancestral perspective, how would this environment be different? And this is probably the most stark difference in my opinion. I'll give you a second to think about how, how you might be able to use this perspective to change something about the environment in which you spend the most time.
And the first thing I would note, um, and it's very relevant to today and to our strategies around staying healthy with respect to the coronavirus, almost everything you hear from public health experts is, is leading us to understand that the outside environment is a very much more safer place to be in this moment. That most people are, are, are catching this virus when they're in close proximity in indoor environments. Um, and this, is, this has always just been my instinct from this perspective. When you have sun that's eventually, um, that's going to degrade this virus quicker. When you have an airflow that's going to move particulates and aerosols away for a, for a, um, a smaller load, viral load. You are outside, you are moving um, on terrain that is not flat and parallel. Um, this is another piece of our indoor environment that it gets us deficient in these kind of terrain nutrients. We are unable to really navigate um, uneven terrain and our balance can get affected because all we experience is flat surfaces all the time. Um, for what it's worth, being outside grounds you like it would ground your plumbing or your electrical systems in your home. If you touch the earth, uh, there is some evidence, again, from small studies, um, that your you're instantly, you're, there, there's evidence that your, your blood sort of flows better, that your joint pain will go away, your inflammatory markers decrease. There's a lot of potential benefit from literally just sitting with and interacting with the earth. And there's microbes. Again, um, I'm not going to get too deeply into this because this is a whole other discussion, but in our indoor environment, which we do require to maintain some sort of cleanliness for our health, it's because we're living on these very um, synthetic surfaces that can grow these pathogenic colonies of things. When you're outside in nature, uh, there's more of a balance of microbial, microbes, bacteria, parasites, viruses, all of these sort of um, uh, things we would consider as part of our uh, microbiota internally are actually living in, in balance in nature externally. Um, unless, of course, we're using things like pesticides and herbicides around our house, and then we are disrupting that balance in some way, which may have some, again, unintended consequences. So Movement is another large disconnect and something that I really work into my daily life um, to correct. When we consider modern movement, we're actually most thinking of exercise. And exercise is kind of the solution to not moving all day. And so it's a huge industry because we're told we have to move, we have to exercise, I don't even know what the recommendation is, like 150 minutes per week, um, which means we are allowed to be sedentary for a whole lot of that week. <laughs> um, but anyway, this is kind of a common scene for exercise or movement in the modern environment. It's indoors, it's on these moving sidewalks or these machines that are, like the elliptical machine is one thing I haven't been able to figure out what natural movement that mimics at all. Our exercise tends not to be very functional. It's really not going to help you to get your daily life done. Um, and it's oftentimes very isolating. A lot of the machines at the gym that I used to use anyway, um, their intent was to work your biceps or to work your quads or it was, it was um, you know, nothing's going to activation, but it wasn't a functional movement, it was a movement just to gain muscle in a specific area. Again, flat and level terrain in these gyms, and, and, and even when we're going out for walks these days, we put on the most um, corrective shoes because we're told our arches need support. And when I see a shoe that has substantial arch support, I question um, how strong that foot 
is and is that arch support really helping the situation it's kind of casting your foot so that your foot cannot gain the strength to maintain an arch um, so that's the kind of questioning I have around our modern um, environment and movement this is a this is completely made up data I did this I made this up <laughs> but it was to prove a point um, along the left side is movement intensity and along the bot the x-axis is time and I've got two graphs here I've got um, what what you would see a toddler doing over the course of the day and what you might see uh, this toddler's mother doing over the course of the day and the toddler gets up moves around I mean basically if you've ever parented a toddler or, or just observed one they're just always moving there's always a low level something that they're doing unless they're napping or maybe you know secured to a seat to eat but mom might get up in the morning move around a little bit and then sit around at work and then maybe move a little bit at lunch and then sit around and then maybe go to the gym and get some real high intensity work for a little bit and then kind of sit around and, and maybe watch some TV at night. So this is the this is a typical modern movement pattern. Again, just to prove a point um, and totally made up. <laughs> so from an ancestral or evolutionary health uh, perspective, how would movement have been different? Is there a requirement for exercise from an evolutionary health perspective. You may have heard some of my ideas already about this, but um, from this perspective, movement just happened in the course of a life. You had to move to eat, for example, if you were foraging or hunting, or even cooking your food. Cooking is, is movement as well, and we've outsourced that in a, lot, in a large way in our uh, modern society. Movement was very functional. Um, we may not have had all of the uh, furniture that we have today. And so one of the things that I've, I've actually wrapped into my own life is to reduce my uh, furniture in my house. My seat to butt ratio is, <laughs> is crazy in my house because uh, I have two chairs and three butts. So we sit on the floor for dinner doing sort of in a, in a Japanese style seating arrangement and my, and really I do this because if I don't sit down on the floor every day and get up off the floor every day I'm not going to be able to sit down on the floor when I'm 90 and get up off the floor and I just want to practice that every day so I've moved that that habit that pattern into my daily life uh, for that I don't think there's such thing as exercise from an ancestral perspective um, so we can we can institute these kinds of things into our life when you make dynamic workstations or you kind of fidget and move around a little bit. It's just a small movement is movement. It, it's not sedentary means literally sitting still. And so if you were to get up and down and up and down throughout the course of your day and maybe stretch a calf or, or reach high in the air, um, usually I, I only ever see human beings put their hands above their heads if they're like in a yoga class. But that's a functional movement that might be useful for you someday um, when you're 80 years old and you want to travel and you want to put your suitcase up into the overhead compartment. Um, if you're not practicing those kinds of moves, you're, you're not going to be able to do those kinds of moves. And then just to carry on with my, my ideas of uh, ancestral movement, this is that same graph of from an evolutionary perspective, what a toddler, how a toddler moved, and maybe how uh, a toddler's parent might have moved. And you can see again the, the intensity of movement along the left side and the x-axis. Now, it doesn't have time, it has sort of time relative to sunlight. Um, 
again, probably no watches <laughs> from an evolutionary perspective. Um, but pretty much, uh, we would have mimicked toddler movement throughout the course of a day. We would have been, been squatting and moving and, you know, not a necessarily a, a high intense kind of way, but just moving. Um, and you don't have to move far. It's not logging steps or miles, I should say. It's, it's just, uh, just moving your body relative to self. There is a very uh, big difference between exercise and the and movement, which encompasses exercise. Um, you can even get down to a cellular level about movement, like how your you want your cells to move. Uh, without movement, there is no life. And finally, the last pillar is this love and community aspect and this is this is maybe multiple pillars but um, you can see here that I've got clearly all the social medias on there and that's definitely a huge part of our modern environment I I admit to spending way too much time on Facebook myself um, connecting with friends uh, that I've actually physically met in life and friends that I've never met in life um, which is a very, very different thing from a, an evolutionary perspective. And also very, uh, because of our, our, our want to connect, it can be very uh, time consuming and it can, it can kind of overlap with things that we really wanna do in our everyday life and kind of get in the way. So there's a really large kind of balance we need to strike here with, um, with social media in terms of um, community. But in general, my general point around this message is that today we kind of each live in our own apartment, own home. We have our own piece of this earth. And we're kind of amassing our own things in this piece of our, you know, in our home. Um, I was building a little garden off the side of my house and I was, I was trying to find a tiller. I didn't realize that five houses in my immediate area, they all had their own tiller. <laughs> So it was really at the ready, I just had to ask. Um, everybody has their own things and we have this, we're kind of living in this thing where we are maybe afraid to ask because maybe we feel like we're a burden on others if we ask. We assume everybody's too busy or doesn't want to be inconvenienced by by any, any of our needs and um, that, that and this whole social uh, social media uh, with respect to communication, I learned in in one of these um, these courses I took that what it's something like ninety five percent of communication is body language and tone, and and the comment section on Facebook really highlights that there's a lot of miscommunication. And so I think from an ancestral perspective, we can look at this and we can very much do better. And I'll give you a minute to think about how you can interact more naturally with your community from that perspective. Some of the things that I, I have written down here are around self-care. If we, um, we have a, a community, and maybe right now uh, we can think of it more of as our, our pandemic bubble, uh, which may include some of our neighbors. We have, um, we have resources that if we have the um, sort of, we, we get over our fear of asking, our fear of being a burden, they can help us. Um, half the time I'm here with my children and if I need a little bit of um, self-care, I, I shouldn't feel like I'm imposing to ask somebody to help if I need that. Um, that's really important to have this sense, sense of not isolation because isolation um, really harms your health. 
ourselves in many ways. Um, we are, human beings are animals. This is really challenging time right now. Whoever decided that social distancing was the right term for this, um, when physical distancing is, is really what they, they mean, really got it all wrong because we need each other from that sort of emotional like support system and um, that's a really important thing uh, to do to check in on people and right now again it's so challenging because you've got if you have an elderly neighbor you, the last thing you want to do is put them in harm's way but we can knock on their doors and we can say you know from a distance hey do you need anything and be part of that sort of um, social solution um, these in-person social support is very important for uh, for building into our lives and it's very different and fulfilling in a different way than just you know liking and commenting on, on social media so these are these are five pillars of ancestral health there may be many more and again um, as I said before, nothing is in isolation. Um, so they all sort of influence each other. And it's, it's, this is your sort of call to action in this, is to look at these areas, see how many you can stack. Um, I have been doing this for like a decade now, and one of the things that is most meaningful to me, and it's kind of one of my minimum requirements for self-care, is that I personally um, do a worker share at a local farm. And this, this kind of checks off so many of these ancestral needs for me um, of, of getting my hands in the dirt, of movement, of being outside in the sun, of helping to grow food for my community. Um, and, um, you know, I can tie sleep into it, I'm sure, by getting a good, you know, a bunch of sun and getting some movement into it. So that's one of the ways that I've been able to kind of uh, fulfill a lot of these needs but again I'll just reiterate this is a journey and um, and you'll find that when you pick off one of these things others will follow there's they're all in they're all interconnected um, and you can literally begin to sort of form your life around these kinds of these ideas of increasing movement, getting a little bit more fresh air and sun, um, in improving your sleep habits, and kind of questioning and redefining what food means to you. And, um, and moving into the sort of real world again with some of these social uh, fundamental needs we have for community. I wanted to end with, uh, I'm really, really interested in this topic. I have been studying this for a very long time, and I would love to lead any discussions uh, with your team about any and all of these things, if you are so inclined. Um, it's really great self-care. It is all stacking together for your health and your personal resiliency. It's empowering because we're not just listening and, t and hearing what people are telling us and checking off their list of needs. Um, this is finding your own list of needs and making those happen. And I would love to chat with anyone who's interested in approaching research from this perspective. I have so many ideas, and I, and I, uh, I don't even know where to begin. Um, it's so fundamental, and it seems so basic, but we've really lost a lot of touch with these, uh, these just aspects of being a, a human animal and being so, so far displaced uh, from what it means, what it fundamentally means to have optimal health. And um, I really do believe that our modern lifestyle is manifesting in diseases of captivity um, that we just fail to see. Thank you.